ಬೇರೆ ಬೇರೆ ರೀತಿಯಿಂದ ಸಮಾಜವನ್ನು ಹಲವು ಮುಖಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಮೊನಚಾದ ಮಾತುಗಳಿಂದ ಬಹಳ ಪ್ರಸಿದ್ಧವಾದ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸೌತ್ ಅನ್ನುವ ಮಾತು ಅದು ಯಾವತ್ತಿಗೂ ಮರಿಲಿಕ್ಕಾಗದೇ ಇರುವ ಮಾತು ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ಯಾರೋ ಒಂದು ಸಭೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಸೌತ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ನೀವೆಲ್ಲ ಬಂದಿದ್ದೀರಲ್ಲ ಅಂತಂದಾಗ ಸೌತ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಅಲ್ಲ ನಾವು ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸೌತ್ ಅನ್ನುವ ಮಾತನ್ನು ಹೇಳುವ ಮೂಲಕ ತನ್ನ ನಿಜವಾದ ಅಭಿಪ್ರಾಯವನ್ನು ಸಮಾಜದಲ್ಲಿ ಬಹಳ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ವ್ಯಕ್ತಪಡಿಸಿದಂತಹ ಶ್ರೀ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಸಾಯಿ ದೀಪಕ್ ಅವರು ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ಉದ್ದೇಶಿಸಿ ಈಗ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿರುವಂತಹ ವಿಷಯ ಟ್ರೀಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ಧರ್ಮ ಬೈ ದಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಅನ್ನುವ ಈ ವಿಷಯದ ಕುರಿತಾಗಿ ತಮ್ಮ ವಿಷಯವನ್ನು ಮಂಡಿಸಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಕೇಳಿಕೊಳ್ತೇನೆ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಮೈ ಅಪಾಲಜಿ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಷನ್ ಆರ್ ಇವನ್ ರಿಮೋಟ್ಲಿ ಕ್ವಾಲಿಫೈಡ್ ಟು ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಫೋರ್ಸ್ ಟು ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಕಾಲನೈಸರ್ಸ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲಿಷ್ ಬಟ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಮೈ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಟು ಮೇಕ್ ಮೈ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಆಸ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಎಸ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಬಟ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಐ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಡ್ ಟು ಡೂ ಸೋ ಐ ಆಫರ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ಅಥಮಾರ ಮಠ ದಿ ಚೀಫ್ ಪಾಂಟಿಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶ್ವಪ್ರಿಯ ತೀರ್ಥ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಈಶಪ್ರಿಯ ತೀರ್ಥ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಫಾರ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಮಿ ಅನ್ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಟು ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೇಟ್ ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಅಕೇಷನ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಡೂ ಮೈ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಟು ಜಸ್ಟಿಫೈ ದಿ ಆನರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿ ಇನ್ವಿಟೇಷನ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಡೆಡ್ ಟು ಮೀ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬಿಲ್ಡ್ ಆನ್ the speech of the previous speaker shri hari kutsa who happens to be a very good friend and uh, what he has not told and i think i i will take it upon myself to tell you is that he is one of the leading members of a trust by the name indi collective trust which happens to be uh, involving itself in the in the movement for freeing temples from state control as someone who has a flourishing practice of his own he has managed to take a significant amount of his professional time to commit to this particular cause which was very very evident from the clarity with which he spoke on the subject and the commitment with which he is he has decided to pursue this particular cause i hope more and more people and qualified professionals join this particular movement and make this an informed movement because i don't think this particular movement can be sustained exclusively on the basis of emotion we need a lot of specific talent and specialized talent from architecture to knowledge of shastras to people who understand how trusts are supposed to be operated auditing standards and accounting standards each of these aspects we need people who can address this so i hope more and more people join this movement and support individuals like shri shri hari kutsa so another round of applause for whatever he's done so the title of the topic that i've chosen or the theme of today's talk is the treatment of hindu dharma by the supreme court to a significant extent there is a decent amount of overlap between shri shri hari speech and what i wish to deliver but i will try to expand upon it and bring out perhaps a larger perspective shri hari's position has been largely from the standpoint of management of hindu religious institutions by the state that has been the specific focus of his speech but management of hindu religious institutions although central and integral to the treatment of hindu dharma treatment of hindu dharma is a larger issue let me repeat myself in a slightly different way obviously control of hindu religious institutions by the state has a serious impact on treatment of hindu dharma by the state 100% but it goes much beyond that because to a significant extent whatever shri hari has submitted is from the standpoint of what the government does, does with temples whereas there is another institution which is which appears to be relatively silent but has had a significant amount of impact on hindu dharma as a whole which is the judiciary because i think it's easier in people's minds to criticize a government because government translates to a politician therefore psychologically you're open to criticizing a politician even more but the moment you think of the judiciary you assume first of all that these people are better informed or at the very least there is a fear of the contempt of courts act <laughs> so it's either respect or fear which prevents you from examining and scrutinizing the conduct of the judiciary compared to the manner and the extent to which you scrutinize the conduct of the state or the government 
Therefore, I will try and present to you a slightly larger picture, building significantly upon what Srihari has presented, and invite you to participate in this particular discussion without violating the Contempt of Courts Act. <laughs> so I will try and keep this discussion as legal, as simple, and as constitutional as possible. But as a practicing Hindu, obviously I have certain reservations and I have certain criticisms of the manner in which my religion and my community has been treated by all arms of the state. And to assume that this is exclusively limited to the government alone would be a mistake. Now the one thing that as a practitioner before constitutional courts of this country that I think people should be aware of is that no court is a monolithic organization. It's not as if one court has one opinion. Because you see in every court there are multiple judges, there are a lot of judges. As a consequence of which, every person has his own opinion, which is human. And therefore, the position of an institution at any given point of time cannot be uniform. Because there are, at any given point of time, over 30 people in that institution holding almost the same position. Now, if there is a fair degree of diversity at any given point of time within the same institution, expand the time scale to 70 years. So can you look for consistency over a period of 70 years? It's very, very difficult. If there is no consistency on any given day between 30 opinions, how can you look for consistency between 30 different opinions spread over 70 years? Therefore, to a significant extent, your destiny as a community is at the mercy of the diversity of that opinion, depending on whether the diversity is in your favor or against you. Now assume for a moment that if the government does something which is unconstitutional, what is the immediate reaction? Let us go to court. But what if you do not agree with the decision of the court? From there, where do you go? What's your next option? You obviously don't have the doors of the president open, always. You can't go back to the government again because you don't know whether the government has enough political incentive to act on your wishes. So why is it that you need an institution such as the judiciary? So here's the simple question. Democracy functions on the assumption that a government is elected by the will of the people, at least a significant majority of the people. Now, therefore, the assumption is that the government represents what you want. If the government represents what you want, and the government has the mandate to effectively give, uh, let's say, implementation or to give effect to your wishes, then why do you need a judiciary? Judiciary is not an elected body. From the district level to the Supreme Court level, you as a people do not have any right to elect anyone or to appoint anyone, correct? Then why do you need an unelected body to preside over the decisions of an elected body? What is the logic behind it? If this is a republic where you have decided to subscribe to a form of government, wherein you vote those people who, who stand for what you want, then why do you have an unelected system to oversee and supervise the conduct of the elected republic? Why? Because the logic is that since it is a constitutional form of democracy, sometimes the politician's decision may not reflect the majority's will. And second, Sometimes, even if it represents the majority's will, it may not be consistent with the constitution. And therefore, you need some kind of a check and balance is the assumption. And that is why you need a judiciary. 
And the reason why you try and have a relatively unelected body such as the judiciary is because the politician has to make a lot of compromises to reach where he has. He needs this vote bank, he needs that vote bank, he needs all these people and their goodwill to reach where he must. And therefore his decision is always subject to and starts from the point of compromise. A politician's decision at the outset is a compromise. It is never ideal. If you were to take individual decisions, you start from an ideal position and then you try and bargain to a middle ground. But the politician's ideal ground is the middle ground. Which means, any decision relating to your religion is not going to start from an ideal position, it is always going to start from a compromised position. And therefore, the hope is that the judiciary is relatively uninfluenced by these vote bank considerations and its only loyalty is to the law, which is the constitution and is therefore best positioned to do justice to your expectations. Because I'm sure everybody as a voter understands and agrees that just because you have voted a certain government to power, you can never be sure that you will be in a position to agree with everything that the government does. Not possible. And you can't even be sure that the government you have voted to power will always take a decision which is in your best interests. Because your best interest is not the sole interest of that government. Right? So if this is the logic, I say this without any self-serving intention. I may be a practitioner before the Supreme Court, but I do understand the sanctity of the institution. Please do not mistake what I'm trying to say. Sanctity of an institution is very different from whether people respect that particular institution today. That's a different question altogether. Therefore, I am of the conscious opinion that it is okay for a society to lose its confidence in the politician. But a society should never lose confidence in the judiciary because that is your option of last resort. And in the current setup, if you lose faith in that particular institution or that institution has not been able to inspire your confidence, then as a community, you really have no option, which is to say the government doesn't want to do what you want it to do. That particular arm of the state which is supposed to act as a check and balance over the government is not in sync with your position. Then the only option that is left to you, unfortunately, are unconstitutional or extra constitutional options, which is not right, which no community wants to be pushed to, and certainly not the Hindu community. Because after all, this is your homeland and therefore you don't want to do anything that undermines the constitution. Whether anybody else has any kind of allegiance to the constitution or not, Hindus certainly continue to have faith in the constitution by default. So therefore, it is extremely important to pay attention to every judicial verdict that concerns your faith and its institutions as much and perhaps even more than what the government does. Because it happens to be a technical outcome or a legal outcome, half of the time people move away from it because they don't know what to make of it. Or the language is a barrier. Or the technicality of the language or the complication of the language is a barrier. And that's one of the reasons that you need people who are in a position to break down for the understanding of the common public, what is the meaning of a certain judgment? Now, it so happens that at least as far as this particular community is concerned, the Hindu community is concerned, it has produced fantastic lawyers. But it hasn't produced enough lawyers who are interested in acting as mediators between the system and the community so that the community is in a position to understand the implications of the system's decisions. 
other communities have on a regular basis because they understand the value or at least they understand the disincentive of not participating in a judicial process. So while I'll circle back to the central theme of the topic, I'm trying to tell you that if, if Hindus do not produce more Hindu-minded lawyers, then I think out of the three arms of the state, you have effectively alienated yourself from an extremely critical arm of the state, which is the judiciary. Hindu lawyers are different from Hindu-minded lawyers. Please understand that critical distinction. So just because you have produced a lot of lawyers who come from your community doesn't mean that these are lawyers who bat for the community. Now, for such investments to be made, you need the institution to be free to invest its resources in the community, which is why his topic is so relevant. The community must have the autonomy to invest in these critical areas without looking for profit or loss. Because nobody else will have that incentive. Whether it's an individual or the government, it will always look for whether it's a profitable decision. But only the community and its institutions can also take a decision which is not exactly profit making, but which is critical, imperative and existential. Because this is what public money and community's money is meant for. Now, coming back to the topic. Swamiji has done something which I would never do with lawyers. Tell them that they can speak for as long as they want. <laughs> so Swamiji has told me that I don't need to look at the watch and I can speak for as long as I want. So I will take full advantage of this as much as possible to give you a few different aspects of the topic. One, when you look at the Supreme Court's treatment of Hindu dharma, I would classify it under different baskets. One, what is the Supreme Court's understanding of Hindu dharma is the first question. Whether it sees Hindu dharma through a dharmic lens or through an anglicized Abrahamic lens is the first question that you should ask. Because if all of us are on the same page, that dharma and religion are not the same as each other, and that since English as a language is poor and cannot accommodate your concepts, therefore you are forced to use religion as an equivalent of dharma, is the judiciary aware of this critical distinction? That's the first question. Second, if dharma is not religion and therefore is not an Abrahamic concept, that means dharma cannot be approached with the black and white lens of Abrahamic religions. Because the one thing that is critical to Hindu dharma is sampradayic diversity, multiple sampradayas. For the followers of a certain sampradaya, their definition of Hindu dharma starts and ends with their sampradaya. That is all they are expected to follow. Why? When you are effectively told you can follow anything you want, and the basket of options that is presented to you is in the form of a vast ocean called Sanatana Dharma, you are bound to be lost in that ocean. Therefore, you need a sampradaya which has a guru at the fountainhead and a deity which is effectively seen as the, as the Gangotri of that particular sampradaya so that you have a very specific path to follow, so that there is clarity in what is expected of you. Therefore, sampradaya and sampradayak diversity are critical to your understanding of Hindu dharma. Now, what does this mean? The deity may be the same in certain sampradayas, but the traditions of each sampradaya with respect to the same deity may be different. So I'll give you an example. 
So there was this popular Padmanabha Swami temple case of Tirunanthapuram where everybody was interested in the treasure. More than anything else, they were interested only in the treasure. Unfortunately so. So one particular gentleman, I don't wish to name any individuals because I'm not interested in individuals, I'm interested in issues and principles. Who had some authority came to the temple and said, why is Venkatesa Suprabhatam not being chanted in the Padmanabha Swami temple? And why is Hanuman Chalisa not being chanted in the Padmanabha Swami temple? Because his point was, Venkateshwara is Vishnu, Padmanabha is Vishnu, so therefore you should be chanting this. This is the failure of even educated Hindus to understand the distinction between deity and sampradaya and, and that specific swarupam, so to speak. So they could be traced from Vishnu, but the manifestation is different. Accordingly, the rituals will be different. The Padmanabha Swami temple has a significant element of Tantra, and therefore what it follows will be different. So you can't say, come and chant Venkateshwara Suprabhatam here. Now, once you understand this distinction, you will not give rise to certain, for, pardon my language, certain stupid questions. So for instance, when the, the Ayapa Swami case was going on, the Sabriwala case was going on, I had this brilliant question being asked on a regular basis. Anjaniya Swami is also Brahmachari, Ayapa is also Brahmachari. Women are allowed inside his temple, why are they not allowed in this temple? So imagine, and these questions were not coming from non-Hindus. These questions were not coming from the Christians and the Muslims. These questions were coming from Hindus, from educated families, supposedly educated families. Let me add that caveat. And who called themselves Hindu families. So their education is certainly in question and their Hindu claim is also an insignificant question according to me. And these were the ones to ask this question. Now, therefore it clearly tells me that it is mighty convenient of us to sit and blame the judiciary or the government or everybody else. But these people come from the society. And this is the reflection of the current state of the Hindu society that these people who occupy these positions of power and responsibility obviously are choices that you have thrown up as a society. And therefore, there is no point in pointing fingers at one particular institution and calling it an anti-Hindu institution when the society itself has become unconsciously or subconsciously anti-Hindu without knowing that. And they believe that they are Hindu simply because they visited a temple. So this critical aspect is important because unless and un until you understand this critical concept of Sampradaya, you will always arrive at the conclusion that Hindu institutions are traditional in nature, they are conservative in nature and that they don't open their doors to everyone and that is why there is a fundamental weakness in Hinduism. And therefore, you will welcome everything at the expense of the living traditions that people like the Puja Acharyas follow. The one thing that as Hindus we have not been able to understand is that the Anushthanas that they follow, we are not in a position to follow nor are we capable of following it. What we follow for all practical purposes is what I would call Samanya Dharma, which is Hindu Dharma as practiced by the common Hindu, which is not the whole and soul of it. It is nowhere as close to, let's say, the purer form or the purest form that it is supposed to be. And therefore, you must strike a distinction between what they are entitled to do and what you are entitled to do because your discipline and your commitment to dharma is not the same. So when someone says, why can't I enter the Garbhagriha? You should ask him, what is your authority? And this authority is not a caste-based question. It is on spiritual practice-based question. Which is to say, are you following the Anushthanas that they are expected to follow? If not, please don't get in. It doesn't make a difference whether you are a woman or a man, it just doesn't make a difference. Now these are aspects which I think are fundamentally muddled in the Hindu mind itself. 
and therefore it is critical to preserve these islands of dharmic purity so that they can continue to spread the message of dharma and remove these layers of ignorance from our heads so that we understand the implications of a judicial verdict because the people who celebrated the sabrimala decision mostly were the hindus not others so the, so it's like this it's a two way street the institution does something without understanding dharma but the community also welcomes it without understanding dharma it's obviously a clap and therefore you need both the hands so when you speak of judicial verdicts one i said you have to ask yourself whether the institution understands the concept of dharma and its distinction from religion point number 1 does it understand the concept of sampradaya and its centrality to hindu dharma point number 2 point number 3 then you go to the question of what is the institution's position with respect to control of nerve centers of dharma and therefore temples point number 5 or other 4 i cannot focus exclusively on how a hindu is being treated in this country when this is not a country which is exclusively of hindus when there are other people also so automatically i'm bound to ask this question not only do i want to know how you're treating me i want to know whether you're treating me at least at par with others so how does the question of equality or discrimination arise if it's an exclusively a hindu country full of only hindus then the question of discrimination between religions does not arise but equality and discrimination become relevant when there are others and you see that they are being treated differently so assume for a moment and i've given this example before that you were a student in a classroom and you realize that the teacher has the power to give corporal punishment physical punishment to every student but the teacher is constantly singling you out and slapping you on a regular basis your first question will be why am i being slapped your second question will be why am i the only person being slapped both these questions will arise so at this point both these questions have arisen in the hindu mind with respect to the judicial treatment and the state treatment of hindus as a community and our institutions now the one thing that you have to realize is that whenever you speak of state control of temples your mind immediately says i need the state for security i need the state for maintenance i need the state for crowd management i need the state to handle administrative issues and therefore i'm happy to tolerate the presence of the state in the temple as long as they don't touch my religion as long as they don't touch my religious affairs according to me there can't be a more self defeating distinction the institutions management and administration is in the hands of a different entity altogether which is dying to call itself a secular entity doesn't want to call itself a hindu entity and a fundamentally secular entity is holding the reins of the administration of your religious institutions and you're operating under the naive belief that they will control only secular aspects which won't have an impact on religious aspects how is that even possible if the money is in their hands the ability and the power to appoint people to different positions is in their hands your security is in their hands how do you hope to have the freedom only with respect to religious affairs how is that even possible not possible so to assume that as long as the state gives me the commitment that it will not interfere with religious aspects of an institution i am happy and therefore my religion is secure impossible because what you believe are the secular aspects are the ones that give you the power to invest in the society money if it is secular is the one that gives you the ability to invest in your community so how can that essential aspect be in the hands of the government shri hari will vouch for this particular fact the jagannath mandir in puri is effectively run by 36 mathas it's called the chatis nijog chatis nijog please correct me if i'm wrong 
it has participation from all the four varnas. All the four varnas, especially during the Ratha Yatra, who we call Adivasis are the ones who have the first right to see the deity as well as pull the Ratha. It has a different tradition altogether. Now, each of the Mathas are in the control of state government bureaucrats. Each of them saying, I don't have money, I don't have money. When the daily ritual of Jagannath Puri as a temple is based on contribution of all the 36 Mathas and over the years, every Matha has I mean, so progressively stopped its contribution to the daily ritual. So what you see in Jagannath Puri, now Sri Hari made an important distinction between big temples and chick chick temples is what he called it, small temples, right? Okay. Now, I am trying to tell you even in these so-called big temples, this is what happens. Now if this is the fate of big temples, then imagine what must be happening with chick chick temples. <laughs> so in these big temples, citing lack of resources, which is the secular aspect which you have given to the government, he is saying, I can't give today's prasada, do whatever you want. I don't have the money to renovate. I don't have the money to maintain this library. I don't have the money to digitize this particular manuscript. I don't have the money to ensure that people do not come and do something that they are not supposed to in a temple in terms of security, employing CCTVs and whatnot. So, this belief goes against dharmic principles because dharma and artha go hand in hand in dharmic philosophy. In fact, if you read Mahapariva's book, Chandrasekhar Saraswati's book, Devatin Kuril and its English tra translation, he makes a very clear point that for fulfillment of dharma you need artha. And therefore, if artha is in the hands of the state, which is the Rajya, how on earth do you think you have the freedom to fulfill your dharma? Not possible. So let us break this wall completely which says religious and secular are two different things. No, that is the Christian mentality, that is Christian philosophy, that is not Hindu philosophy. Hindu philosophy effectively says dharma and artha go hand in hand. We realize that you need Lakshmi to run even an institution that is dedicated to Saraswati. We are very clear about that. We don't need to be embarrassed about the fact that you need money to run a religious institution. Hinduism does not celebrate poverty. It does not celebrate poverty. If you believed in poverty, would you be able to provide facilities to all the followers of this particular matha or any other matha for that matter when they come from different places? They come from all walks of life. All of them may not be equally placed as far as their status is concerned. Therefore, the one place that they come must act as a leveler so that everybody is treated as one here and therefore facilities must be provided. Where will that money come from? So when someone tells you, why should a religious institution have so much money? Please ignore that person as a secular Hindu idiot because he doesn't know what he is talking about. Anyone who tells you that a religious institution must not have money because the moment it has money it is corrupt, then thank you, let the state not collect taxes. Because the moment you contribute something by way of tax to the state, well, it is bound to become corrupt. And the state is fundamentally corrupt according to me. Whether it has money or not, it doesn't make a difference. So therefore, first break that wall in your head. Second, I'll keep giving you examples as I go along. When you have a matha or a temple, why do Hindus contribute land to that particular temple or matha? What is the logic? Two reasons, largely two reasons. One, that the temple or that land acts as a source of revenue for the temple. That's one. Second, land translates to real estate, translates to Hindu presence. So that the land which is adjoining a temple or a matha must be owned by people 
who are followers of the sampradaya of that matha so that they respect the tradition of that matha or temple. Otherwise, you will have slaughterhouses open right outside the matha. If it happens to be a shakta matha, then that's a different issue. It can have a slaughterhouse, no problem. But even then, it must be cut not in the halal fashion, but in the Hindu fashion, which is the jhatka fashion. Therefore, even if it, if it happens to be a shakta tradition, I would be happy to give a meat house to someone who happens to be a practitioner of the shakta tradition and to nobody else. Not just to any Hindu, I will give it only to someone who practices that particular sampradaya. Understand that. So even within Hinduism, if the temple or the matha subscribes to a particular philosophy, the administration and the assets of that particular matha or temple must be with the followers of that particular philosophy. It's not enough if, he's, if he happens to be a Hindu. Please understand that. So think of Hinduism like a telescope. The largest lens or the bigger lens is the Hindu lens, but it keeps opening into small lenses and each small lens is the sect and the subsect. So if the institution belongs to the subsect, then the institution must be run by people who are in that particular subsect. Why is this point important? Two days ago, the Supreme Court has come out with a verdict saying, when you issue or when you issue tenders for shops surrounding a certain temple, apparently non-Hindus can apply for that particular tender. Because it is a secular activity. What has it got to do with religion? You see how this distinction works? The moment you separate the secular from the religious in the context of a religious institution, you are creating an anomaly because everything about a religious institution is religious, 100%. Why? Because I am interested in using the resources of my community only for my community is good and nobody else is good. I am entitled to make that particular statement. I don't need to prove my secular credentials with respect to a religious institution. If I can't be religious with respect to a religious institution, where will I be religious? I don't understand. <laughs> Look at the stupidity of this position. This is the one place where I'm allowed to wear my religion on my sleeve. Where I'm entitled to say, yes, I'm a Hindu. Yes, I'm a Shakta. Yes, I'm a Shaivite. Nobody else who does not subscribe to this particular Sampradaya has a business entering into this particular place. Whether you're a Hindu or not doesn't make a difference. As long as you do not subscribe to the traditions of this particular place, you will not set foot inside this place. That should be your position. What is so wrong about this? A Baptist cannot enter the, the church of a Seventh-day Adventist. They have these denominational rivalries going on all, so much that if one person from one particular denomination marries another person from another particular denomination, they will be denied even access to burial grounds. Do we do that in our communities? If that is the case, it is important for the judiciary to understand one or two things. One, when it strikes a distinction between religious aspects of a religious institution and secular aspects of a secular institution, it is effectively pushing a Hindu dharmic institution into a Christian setup. I'll give you another example. And Srihari is aware of this because both of us have worked on quite a few matters together. What is the word in English for Sampradaya? Religious denomination is the word that the constitution uses for Sampradaya. Now religious denomination as a word in the 1950s obviously could have meant only Christian denominations because this word is traceable and its definition in Oxford dictionary around that period obviously was not a reference to Hindu institutions in the 1950s. So when this word was being interpreted by the Supreme Court in 1954 in the Shirurmat judgment which is one of the Ashtamathas Please read that judgment because it has huge consequences. And that is currently the subject of the Sabarimala judgment as well, as well as petitions relating to freeing temples from state control. 
So what I will do is that I will share the link to the judgment to the organizers so that all of you can read it. Now assume for a moment that you are trying to find the meaning of a term that is used in Quran. Will you refer to the Oxford Dictionary to understand its meaning? You will not. Then why do you want to use the Oxford Dictionary to understand the meaning of the word Sampradaya? What is the logic? So in that judgment, which is treated as the landmark judgment on what is the meaning of a religious denomination, not one reference to one Hindu commentary on what is the meaning of a Sampradaya. Because the court was trying to understand what is the role of a Matha and what is the role of a Mathadipati in a Matha. And the question was whether a Matha and its followers constitute a religious denomination within the meaning of Article 26 so that they can protect their independence in matters of running the institution as well as religious affairs. This was the question that the court was asking. During the entire analysis, not one whisper on what is the meaning of a Matha. Whether a Matha or a Sampradaya as understood in Dharma is the same as the manner in which a religious denomination is understood in Christianity. No such question is ever asked. Why? Because the constitution is written in English. And therefore, your go-to reference when you don't understand the meaning of a word or if you think it's ambiguous is an English dictionary. So understand the close nexus between Bhasha and thinking. How they influence each other and what kind of outcomes it can lead to. So in that judgment, here's what the Supreme Court does. It says, Mathadipati is someone who is meant to be the custodian of that particular institution and therefore, if an executive officer is appointed by the state to supersede the powers of the Mathadipati and take away his power to run that particular institution, it effectively translates to government takeover of the Matha, which is not permissible. To that extent, the court is right. Now, since that judgment was delivered in the context of a matha, and this was in the context of the Hindu religious and charitable endowment legislations of then Madras presidency, which included current day Karnataka, certain parts of Andhra Pradesh, and current day Tamil Nadu, the Tamil Nadu government said, since that judgment was delivered only in the context of a matha, according to the Supreme Court, I can't take over a matha, but I can take over a temple which is not connected to a matha. So the logic of the state government is, it was a matha which was the subject of the judgment, not a temple which is not connected to a matha. And therefore, the freedom and independence that is available to a matha is not available to those institutions that are not connected to a matha. So today as it stands, as the law stands, these legislations strike a distinction between temples which are standalone temples and temples which are connected by connected to mathas. In the process, some have become second grade institutions. Now ask yourself a simple question. If the issue is of religious autonomy of a religious or let's say autonomy of a religious institution, why should the logic be different between a matha and a temple? What is the logic? If you believe that the state is fundamentally a secular entity under the current constitution, whether it is a matha or a temple which is not connected to a matha should not make a difference to the fact that a secular state has no business being inside that particular institution. That logic is uniformly applicable. That particular logic has not occurred to the Indian state for the last 60 years. So as a consequence, what has happened is, despite the Shirurmat judgment clearly saying that the state does not have the power to take over a religious institution permanently, all it can do is to rectify mismanagement and get out of that particular institution and give it back to the community. 
for the last 60 years, at least since 1959. Despite a Supreme Court judgment, state governments have taken the position that the judgment does not apply to standalone temples. And therefore, you have executive officers who have been appointed across the board, with or without reasons, in temples across the board in all the southern states, at least in Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, Telangana. And the situation is not that different in, let's say, Uttar Pradesh. Uttarakhand has just come about with a recent legislation withdrawing its own, its own uh, let's say, control over temples. That too, after massive public pressure. But the point I'm trying to make is, even the Supreme Court's verdict has no value and its position has no value when it comes to the rights of the Hindu community. Now, therefore, if the problem statement is that either the institution sometimes does not understand your position or even if it happens to understand your position by some happy coincidence, the state is not willing to listen to the Supreme Court, then what are the options left to the Hindu community? I am posing this question to the community as a practicing lawyer, saying what are the options available to you if even the word of the highest constitutional court of the land has no value in the eyes of state governments. Now what I have realized over the years, in my limited years of practice before the Supreme Court, or for that matter any constitutional court, is that it appears that all arms of the state are fairly sensitive to public opinion. So whenever we speak on this particular subject, we are constantly asked by members of the audience, what can we do as practicing Hindus? What is it that we can do? So I will give a slightly mischievous suggestion. Make sure that any government appointee in a religious institution, especially in a Hindu institution, is pushed to the limits of compliance, which is to say, he must constantly fear questions from the public. It must not be an easy ride for him under any circumstances. I am not asking members of the public to do anything that is illegal. I am merely saying make sure that whatever he does is legal and if, even if he has the slightest of intentions of making a departure, he must fear public reactions in terms of vocal reactions. I don't mean unconstitutional reactions, I'm saying vocal reactions. To the extent that anyone who is appointed as an executive officer to any Hindu institution must tell himself, my Sade Sati seven and a half has begun. And this is my punishment posting. Because I can come and tell you a few things about what the Supreme Court has said and what are the legal differences and nuances and technicalities. But I think it's time to arm the public with solutions, practical solutions. I don't think it makes sense for anyone sitting in some remote part of the country to sit and worry about what will happen to all the money in Tirupati. You first worry about the temples in your street and then you think about Tirupati. <laughs> Unless and until you're able to make an example out of state appointees in institutions which are in your proximity and in your vicinity, you are in no position to sit and talk about Tirupati. Look at the scale of the problem there. Jewels are gone, gold is lost. Tirupati's money is dipped into like state coffers for building of flyovers, for building of institutions which have got nothing to do with Tirupati, that particular temple. So it's almost as if the temple is running the city and certain parts of the state. If that is the case, you might as well call it a Hindu Rashtra. So therefore my point is, work towards practical, workable, local solutions. The thing that you can do as a practicing Hindu is to take an active interest in the running of the affairs of your local temples first. The Chik Chik temples that Sri Hari kept talking about. Focus on them, protect them. Ask yourself if the current pujari of that particular temple has to leave that particular temple for whatever reasons. Do you have a replacement? 
in how many temples of your ishta devatas or your kula devatas do you actually have people to continue that particular tradition i faced that problem personally when i went to my ishta devata or let's my kula devata temple i didn't even know if there would be the next person to take over the matter the mantle from there on these are real time issues when a temple falls under disuse it becomes public property and it is ripe and open for encroachment and illegal encroachment and when you think of a temple don't limit yourself only to that particular institution think of it as an ecosystem which means when you think of a temple you should immediately ask most temples have lands associated with them what is the status of the land associated with this particular temple and you will find that most of them are under encroachment and illegal occupation and certainly not in most cases not by members of the community at least if it's members by the of the community then you can still kind of hope to regularize it take some rent but if it's members of some other community secularism will immediately come in the way and you will not be able to take action second on the aspect of whether it makes sense to go to court on a regular basis unless and until you have a master solution coming from the state you have no other option but to court, go to court on a regular basis and a master solution will come from the state not because it suddenly grows a hindu conscience but because there is an incentive to look into that particular issue or there is a disincentive to not pay attention to it either you get votes or you lose votes only then the state will listen and therefore it is time that this particular movement becomes a mass movement owned by members of the hindu community and not by lone individuals here and there it is time that this attracts a critical mass of people who talk about this on a regular basis it is not just about education it's not just about let's say civilization let's think of very very real issues the only way that you can conceivably stop conversions at this particular point of time is if you have the ability to use the resources of your community to protect people and give them livelihoods that's the only way to do it the state government is using your money to give benefits to others i am saying use your money to protect your people and stop them from leaving the fold it has become as critical as that otherwise you will struggle to take out a rath yatra in 10 or 15 years time you will not be able to given what's happening across the country you will not be in a position to celebrate your festivals with the same kind of freedom that you're able to at least now this is not a great situation but even this won't be there second legal outcomes and the process is definitely slow there is no doubting it in india everything is slow so why do you expect the judicial process to be fast it will move at the same pace but it is important to invest in it because you don't want a decision to be taken behind your backs or while you're a mute spectator on the sidelines because then the court has the excuse or even at least the state has the excuse to say why was there no representation from members of the community if they wanted to protect something which they hold dear if you believe that something is important you show it in action by participating in that particular process not by staying in the sidelines three even in a judicial process don't lose heart because there are any number of examples in indian judicial history where persistence has paid off and even a negative decision has been reversed at some point of time you are not investing in the next 5 years or 10 years or 15 years you are effectively investing in the next 35 to 40 years because you are racing against the anti dharmic investment of at least the last 150 years and at the very least the last 70 years so you should be looking at at least conservatively speaking two decades of significant investment freeing temples from state control is not the destination it is the means to another destination it is the beginning of a journey so unless and until this particular goal itself is achieved 
in a conceivable and a relatively foreseeable timeline there are so many other issues which this particular issue itself can address that you will not be in a position to think of it i'm throwing a couple of wild options open today hindu fertility rate is significantly going down because educated couples do not want to have more than one child or even having one child has become a serious issue if the institution were to take if every sampradaya and its matha were to take the responsibility to say one child for yourself and one child for the community we will take care of the one child we will take care of it entirely if the community or let's say its institutions have the freedom and the resources to take those decisions to a significant extent you will be in a position to even replace yourself which is to say and to quote a, a philosopher a contemporary philosopher at the very least every civilization's duty is to replace itself which is to say you must at least have equal number of people who can occupy your positions today hindu fertility rate has significantly gone down and we are not even sure if we are in a position to replace it so look at the kind of serious problems that this particular institution is capable of addressing provided it doesn't fight this battle with both hands tied to its back which is what it is doing at this point strengthen your sampradayik institutions by giving them the confidence that you will back them in their negotiations with every arm of the state that your dharmic institutions can negotiate with the powers so to speak with the confidence and the comfort and assurance that its followers stand by them when someone says all of these problems are because hindus don't have unity hindus don't have unity what are you talking about are you telling me that every other community has unity no they have unity only when it comes to an outsider but otherwise they keep arguing and fighting among themselves in this case if every matha is at least confident of the fact that its supporters can protect themselves and will also stand by the matha whenever it is in negotiation with the government or with anybody else imagine the comfort with which the matha can operate and when bigger mathas are in a position to basically say notwithstanding our philosophical differences we will support each other because if we don't support each other we will be picked one by one at least operate under that particular pragmatism according to me the template for hindu unity is right in front of you you don't need to destroy sampradayik diversity to create hindu unity you can preserve your sampradayik diversity and also create hindu unity provided you know what are you united against and for since the ashtamathas or at least some of them have the glorious tradition of having participated in the ram janmabhoomi movement i can make this particular statement nobody participated in that movement as a brahmin kshatriya vaishya or any other community they participated in that movement as a hindu for a hindu cause so what does it tell you create a specific goal because the human mind cannot operate when you give it a vague goal it needs very specific goals you need to break it down and say this is what you're fighting for it's like trying to fight an election without showing who is the candidate you're voting for why do you need to show a face because you need to know which is the face that is most associated with this particular party and its causes similarly a cause is the face of the movement so rally the community around causes identify specific causes be it cow slaughter or conversions or everything i am of the very clear view that the master key to unlock the solution to all these problems is to unlock the potential of your civilizational nerve centers namely the mandir and the matha period the day these institutions have the freedom to do what they are constitutionally allowed to to the fullest extent i dare say the hindu community will be in a much better position to negotiate with the state with respect to its interests and protect its interests you will not surrender your destiny in the hands of any particular organization or certainly not in the hands of a political organization 
you will more than happily surrender your destiny to your religious and sampradayic organizations, which is a more reliable organization. Because their only allegiance is to you and to the sampradaya. Period. Not to anybody else. Desha, of course, but dharma and therefore desha. So, my suggestion to you would be that given what this country is facing, we will be in a position to preserve the dharmic fabric of this country provided dharmic institutions are in a position to protect and preserve and perpetuate themselves. So as opposed to sitting and thinking of an institution that is at some distance and thousands of kilometers away from you, hug your institution as tightly as possible and give them the maximum support that you can. And make sure that there is at least someone from your family that you contribute towards the perpetuation of these traditions. Do not take pride in the fact that you've given so much of freedom to your children that they have no idea what their traditions are. I don't think that's a badge of honor to wear at all under any circumstances. That's a badge of shame. So if you can contribute to your sampradaya, you would have contributed to dharma and desha. Whenever the judiciary is seized of an, in, of an issue which has a Hindu bearing or a Hindu consequence or a Hindu interest. I am making this statement with a lot of responsibility and I cannot be faulted for this. Hindu representation must be there and apolitical Hindu representation must be there so that you protect your interests regardless of political interests. Do not surrender your religious interests at the feet of and the altar of political interests. Because politicians and governments will come and go, dharma in civilization is permanent. If you cannot create a system where your interest is the supreme interest and everybody is trying to come to you to protect your interest, then you have failed because you have to understand, learn from religious minorities of this country because regardless of whoever is in power, everybody wants to come to them for vote banks and to protect them. Whereas that's not the case with us. We are forced to choose either this or that. Why not everyone? That is possible only if you focus on what Sri Hari has just told you, which is religious institutional autonomy. A Hindu thinks of himself as an island and he always finds himself alone because he does not have an institution to back him. Because that institution is in the hands of the state. Remove the state from your institutions and ask yourself if the Hindu will continue to feel alone. I dare say you will not. People call Hindus cowards, I don't know why. Because without institutional support, without state support, Hindus are doing so much. They are actually fighting against a tide against them. And he is not doing this with numbers on his side. So I certainly don't see cowardice as something which is characteristic of Hindus. I'm so sorry, you have inherited a, a tradition and an inheritance of valor. So therefore, find a way to support your institutions. This is not an academic pursuit. This is an existential pursuit. It is extremely critical, not for the next 25, 30 years, but next for the next 5 years and 10 years. That is the pace at which the problem is moving. And if the problem is moving at that particular pace, at the very least, the solution must move at a pace which is half of the problem space, which is not the case today. Stop operating under the belief that Hindus are corrupt as a community and therefore they are not in a position to run their institutions. Will you have the guts to say this about institutions and sampradayas of which you are a party? You will not say this. Then why do you assume that with respect to other institutions? Or is it your belief that corruption is peculiarly Hindu? Are you telling me that there is no corruption in any other religious institution? How is that even possible? So start putting faith in your community. If you don't do that, I believe that the time for hand wringing and empty posturing has run out. Because every security threat, whether it is internal or external, has a direct bearing on the ability of Hindus to survive and live in this country with dignity. Almost everything which affects this country in a negative way affects you first, because you are the target. You are the intended target.
So, as I keep saying in other places, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, please read it to imbibe the spirit of Kshatra. That is the only way forward. And that spirit of resistance and Kshatra must show in every endeavor, including in representation in legal causes before the highest court of the land in every court of the land. Start cultivating a vast network of Hindu minded lawyers or at the very least competent lawyers who are willing to work and therefore start pooling your resources to invest in your causes. Do not take illegal encroachment of your religious institutions, land or real estate lightly. It is not meant to be taken lightly because that is the way Hindu exodus begins. Gradually, slowly, but surely and steadily. So the only way is for you to invest significantly in this department. I've gone well beyond the theme of the topic because I didn't see the point in making a technical discussion of law, constitution and everything else. I just didn't see the point in doing that. Because this is the big picture. That is merely a means to an end. This is the end. This is the end game. Dharmo Rakshati Rakshita. Atyanta Mukhevada Binduana. ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಮುನ್ನೂರ ಅರವತ್ತು ಡಿಗ್ರಿ ಇದೆ ಅಂತ ತೋರಿಸುವ ಎಲ್ಲ ಮುಖಗಳನ್ನು ಪರಿಚಯಿಸಿ ತೋರಿಸಿದ್ದು ಬಿಂದು ಆದರೂ ಅದು ಅಷ್ಟು ದಿಕ್ಕುಗಳನ್ನು ತನ್ನೆಡೆಗೆ ಸೆಳೆಯುವ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಇದೆ ಆ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಈ ನೆಲದ ಸಹಜವಾದ ಧರ್ಮಕ್ಕಿದೆ ಅನ್ನೋದನ್ನು ಪ್ರತಿಪಾದಿಸಿದಂತಹ ಶ್ರೀ ಸಾಯಿ ಜಯದೀಪಕ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಹೃತ್ಪೂರ್ವಕವಾದ